Today, you guys you are going to learn about a ministry that ministers around the world, most notably, at least in my book, uh, South Sudan. This is a ministry other than my family and my pastor in this fellowship. There's been no greater impact in my, on my spiritual walk than this ministry right here. For about 20 years, this church has been walking alongside far-reaching ministries. We see what it does around the world. We see the, how genuine it is. We see how powerful it is. We see how it glorifies God. We see how it glorifies Jesus. And we are very, very happy and just very proud to be alongside this ministry. Pastor Kevin's been uh, ministering in South Sudan for uh, roughly 20 years, give or take. And I myself have been able to uh, minister there for the, about the last 10 years, roughly. Um, again, it's been extremely impactful on my walk. Um, I've watched churches built. I've watched schools be built. I've watched orphans fed. I've watched widows taken care of, houses built for widows. I've watched the poor get fed. I have watched chaplains, men in South Sudan, get raised up. Um, who would have otherwise been, you know, lowly men? I wouldn't say shameful men, but lowly men. And through this ministry, they were raised up to be great men of God, just powerful men for the Lord. I've watched this ministry literally change a nation. Think about that, you guys. This ministry has changed an entire nation. And it's all done through the obedience of those who serve in it, and uh, most notably, Wes Bentley here. He's the director, he is the visionary for this ministry, and he's a great, great encouragement to me. And uh, I'm so excited to be alongside with you, Wes. And uh, so you guys are gonna learn about this ministry today, and uh, you're gonna be all the better for it too. Come on up, Wes. Well, guys, uh, I'm blessed to be here. I actually just got back in from overseas uh, the Wednesday before last, uh, flew in from South Sudan. And uh, I know it's been a number of years, and uh, it, it's just good to be back here. I actually uh, lived in Washington for a number of years, uh, lived in Moses Lake, lived in Yakima, lived on Bainbridge Island, and uh, I joined the Marines on 2nd Street in Seattle many, many years ago. And so it was somewhat, it always feels like coming home. And then uh, both... Uh, Dustin and Kevin have been a tremendous blessing to our ministry. Their wives are saints for allowing them to come over as much as they do to minister there. I've, I, can't, I can't believe how many vacations they've given up just to come and do the work of God. It's been uh, quite the blessing. Uh, in sharing with you this morning as we prepare to get into the message, folks, we're going to be in uh, Acts chapter 9. And I know that it's been a while since we've been here, so I want to give a little bit of an understanding to you guys of what we're talking about before we get into the message. Uh, we have been involved in the longest running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last about 64 to 65 years of the nation, we have had over 40 years of declared war, but there's really been no time in the last 64 to 65 years that we have not fought somewhere in the southern Sudan, and we're fighting on multiple fronts uh, right now. Uh, I just had to go up to the capital of Juba, uh, uh, South Sudan about two weeks ago today, really, and I uh, was going up there to meet with some of the generals, and uh, the road that we traveled, there had been 12 ambushes, on, or 12 or 13 ambushes, and 27 people killed on that road uh, just within a period of about 20 days, so that's kind of the violence of that country there. Uh, about 20 years ago, we became the official training arm for the South Sudanese, Sudanese Army of training all pastors and chaplains for their military, and they're like, not what we think of chaplains in America, guys, these are front line combat chaplains. All of my men are armed. All of them go into battle. And I know that seems a little strange right now, but as we get in the message, I think you'll have a, a little bit of a better understanding of what we are talking about here. Uh, we get the guys up at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, we run them nine miles, four and a half miles up a mountain, four and a half miles down. And then we have eight hours of class time and two and a half hours of study time. We only feed the guys two meals a day. And the reason we do that isn't because we can't afford to feed them better. We can but if we don't train them hard, they will not survive. 
Uh, once they graduate, they're deployed to forward operation units in the South Sudan Army, where we go into very, very heavy combat conditions. And we want to start by showing you guys a couple of photos if we can bring the first one up here so that we can give you a little bit of an understanding of what we're talking about. There we go. This is the uh, front gate of, the south, of our base there. Now, guys, it's very deceiving. Uh, our base, over 700 people can sleep on this compound, be fed and housed there for over a year. Uh, these walls are designed to stop 50 caliber machine gun bullets. If you're, if you're not familiar how powerful that is, one bullet can just about cut a man in half. One of the things that we're doing in, our, in uh, the village of uh, Nimali, South Sudan, is uh, we're building uh, 12 or 10 castle towers across it, kind of like the ones that you saw there. Uh, on four sides, there's going to be a biblical mosaic in it going all the way from Genesis to Revelations. And one of the reasons we're doing that is there's literally no jobs in the southern Sudan. Uh, not this last summer, but the previous summer, uh, the southern Sudan was upgraded to the third most dangerous nation in the world to live in. Uh, first was, uh, it was uh, Iraq, and then it was Syria, and then the southern Sudan came in first. We used to be just fighting the radical Islamic army of the north. I talked to one of the generals that was in intelligence and he said, we are now fighting five different armies and there's 148 different rebel groups operating in the southern Sudan. It's a very violent part of the world over there. Uh, we'll just move on with the message, folks. It's not coming up right now. If it does, I'll try to get into it and explain it to you. And this morning as we prepare to get in Acts chapter nine, you know, one of the things that I wanna share with you guys, you having been raised in Calvary Chapel, uh, you've been taught extremely well. Uh, one of the things about being believers, uh, the way that Calvary takes you through the Bible, verse by verse, okay, here, here's uh, the picture of our church, Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimali, South Sudan. And this is, uh, uh, we have three services on Sunday. The first is in English, the second is in Arabic, and the third is in Mahdi, which is a local dialect. And we're starting a fourth service for Eritreans that have had to flee their country because of persecution. Next one, Let's see if it comes up. These are the children. Uh, we get anywhere from about 12 to 1,800 children on a Sunday now. Uh, if it's raining, we'll get about 1,200. If it's, uh, if, if it's sunny out, we'll get about 1,800 because they all walk to church. Let's see if we get the next one. These are the guys in both uh, field operation and dress uniforms. Next one. This is a completely different facility in northern Uganda. It's a school that we opened up for children. We just reopened it. We opened it last year. Like everywhere else in the world, it was shut down because of the virus. It's now been reopened. Again, the reason for the high walls is to protect from Islamic terrorism, and these walls have armed guards on them. Next one. These are the children, as you can see in the school. And guys, the school is basically free. We, we charge the families a nominal fee, about $3 a month. And the only reason we do that is everybody over there has told us if you don't charge them something, they will never appreciate it. They have to have some investment in it. So we charge a nominal fee. But the kids live there, eat there, and are being raised in the Lord. A lot of these children are coming from Muslim families. And the Muslims have given us complete uh, authority to teach, raise their children and teach them about Jesus Christ. In the center is the president of Southern Sudan, Seva Kill. Uh, he's the one in the uniform. The man in the light blue jacket is the commanding general of the South Sudan army. I was just at his house two weeks ago. And uh, folks, please praise for him. He will probably most likely be the future president of the Southern Sudan. One of the things that I've talked to him about is, I, you know, we've talked about the fact that the Bible says in the last days that Christians will be hated by all nations, that persecution is coming all over the world for the believing church. And we wanted to open Sudan up to be a Christian nation, where we'll actually declare it to be a Christian nation. He's all on board with this. And what we want to do is send a message to the world where Christians are being slaughtered and murdered and say, you can come here and live safely uh, if God calls you to do that. Some are called to live in an area of persecution, but that's one of the plans that we have for that part of the world. So it's something really to keep in prayer. He's a very godly man. Uh, I actually brought him to America a few years ago to get a bullet taken out of him. Uh, I took him down to Scripps uh, in San Diego and uh, they actually x-rayed him and they called me up on the phone. They said, Wes, uh, which piece of lead are you talking about? The guy's got so much metal in his body, we don't know which one you're talking about. So we were able to give them a little bit of direction and get that taken care of while we were there. Uh, guys, one of the things that I wanted to share with you this morning uh, as I was sharing about being uh, in Calvary Chapel, going by verse by verse through the Bible, we are extremely well taught. Uh, there's a lot of great teachers out there. They teach topically. But again, you don't really get the Bible in the context of which you are supposed to understand it. But I do believe that there are some things that are still universally misunderstood among the body of Christ. For example, most of us understand that salvation is a free gift of God. 
But what a lot of Christians do not understand is that the rewards of heaven are earned. And if you never do anything for Christ in this life, why do you expect great treasure on the other side of eternity? The Bible says in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But guys, it doesn't say they're all mansions. It says there's many mansions. I've often wondered how many one-bedroom flats or two-bedroom condos are up there. <laughs> and I think it's really strange to think that if we never serve Christ, we expect these great rewards on the other side of eternity. One of the things that I believe that God has intended for the church, many of us become born again, and we began to travel what I would call the narrow road. But I believe that there was a road that God intended for the church to travel that most of us never travel, and I would call it the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus, before he would become Paul the Apostle, he was a Pharisee. He was very high in the religious order of that day. And folks, he was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel, and Gamaliel talked a lot about Saul, and he said one of the hardest things he found for him was finding enough books for him to read. He's authored many of the books of the New Testament, and I believe that he would probably test at a genius level today. And I think that God used him because of his great intellect to rightly divide the Word of God and put it down the way it was meant to be put there. Plus, he had a tremendous commitment to the Lord. But as he is traveling the road to Damascus, he's going there to persecute the church. He believes the church to be some type of a cult. But as he's going there, he has an encounter with Jesus Christ. Once he has that encounter with Jesus Christ, his life is forever changed. He is literally never, ever the same man again. Whatever his dreams were before, whatever his ambitions, whatever his goals were, it all ended at that one moment in time. And folks, I believe this is one of the things that's supposed to happen to the church that's not happening today. We are supposed to be a people who are lost in Christ, but we're missing that. God has called us to have this radical experience where our lives literally do not belong to us anymore, but we are a people who are lost in Jesus Christ. And I want to start out by reading you a portion of Paul's conversion, starting in Acts chapter 9, verse 1. It says, and Meanwhile, Saul was still bringing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked her for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go in the city and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priest who caused all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, their kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house. He entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who had appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now folks, many people believe this is where Paul the Apostle started his ministry, but that's not what happened at all. For about the next 13 years, Paul the Apostle disappears. We really do not know much about his life during this time. The scripture is strangely silent on this. We know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that we know almost nothing about his life. When Paul does start his public ministry, he will only have 22 years of ministry before he's going to be killed for his faith. Halfway through, he taught, writes the second book of Corinthians, and in chapter 11, he talks about the suffering that he went through in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger of the country, in danger from bandits, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? 
Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. The reason the Jews would give 40 lashes minus one, meaning 39 lashes, is they used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather was pieces of bone, pieces of shell, and pieces of metal. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of the body. Early historians describe it as being a massacre. And the reason they gave 39 lashes is most men died at 40. Now, not everybody made it to 39, but as a general rule, at 39 you would survive, and at 40 you would die. They literally learned to beat a person within an inch of their life. Historians have told us that often men that went through this beating, it was so severe, even if they survived it, they went insane. They were never normal again. Their brains never worked right again. The pain was just so severe for them. Yet Paul says of his life, I count my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race which God had set before me. See, he was a man that was completely lost in Christ. His life no longer belonged to him. And I think this is what made Paul so dynamic and so effective for the ministry. You know, folks, I think about my own road to Damascus experience, and it did not come when I first got saved. I had lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the United States Marine Corps. I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam, and I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion. I trained at the Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base. We had our own specialized type of training. And I was a competitive shooter in the Marines. I used to shoot battalion and division matches. I was what was called a PMI, a primary marksmanship instructor. And my coach actually said to me, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think that you can shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. So I never had any interest in going down that road there. But I remember that when I gave my life to Christ, folks, it, it dramatically changed me. Uh, when, I, when I got in the Marine Corps and the Vietnam War ended, we started to mount up and go overseas, but they called the war off and we all came back home. So I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go to Rhodesia, which is modern day Zimbabwe, and become a soldier of fortune. Fortunately, Christ would get a hold of my life and it would change everything about me. Uh, I am the oldest of four boys in my family. My sister's the youngest of five of us. Uh, my brother Rick, who followed me, uh, who was also in the Marine Corps, he was an officer, he was in Special Forces, and Rick told my mother many years after I got saved, he said, you know, Mom, he goes, when Wes left to join the Marine Corps, he goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was literally the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He goes, when he would fight people, he wouldn't just fight them, he would purposely try to damage them and injure them, and he was extremely cruel with his words. And folks, I don't know if was, I was trying to be so evil, but I grew up in some areas where there's some rough areas, and often there were gangs, and it was never one against one, it was 10 against one. And I just got to the point as a young child, I couldn't reconcile it, and I couldn't deal with it. So I got myself a German Mauser pistol, and I just said, if I have to kill someone, this is going to stop. And I had a switchblade that was about this long. I loved it because when I pushed the button, it would clack, and it would scare people to death. And uh, so when I would beat someone up, I would beat them very severely. And really what I was trying to do was send a message to people, which was, leave me alone. And it worked quite well. But the other side of my personality, if I saw a young, hand, a young kid that was handicapped being picked on, I would go to the defense of that child. Truthfully, I just think I was scared and I didn't know how to handle life because I didn't have Christ. But once Christ came into my life, it literally changed everything about me. And... Uh, I remember that my road to Damascus experience didn't come right away. It came about a couple years after I got out of the Marine Corps. Uh, I went to a large church in Southern California. It was not a Calvary Chapel, but it was an outstanding church. And the pastor of that church was one of the foremost theologians of our generation today. The first book that I read after I read the Bible, and folks, I was reading the Bible as much as nine hours a day for a while. Now, normally two to three hours, but sometimes seven, eight, nine hours a day. But I read a book called Tortured for Christ written by Richard Wombrandt. Richard Wombrandt was a Romanian pastor and he spent 14 years in prison and he was tortured extensively for his faith. Now he could have easily been killed by the Romanian government, but because he was a leader of the church, they wanted to break him so they could break the church in Romania. And he spent 15 years in prison suffering for his faith. I heard that he was speaking at this very large church and I remember I went there to see him speak. And when Reverend Wombrandt walked into the auditorium, he walked in wearing his socks. He didn't have his shoes on. And the reason he did that was when he was in prison, often they would try to get him to deny his faith. He would refuse to do it, so they would take his shoes and socks off, they would lay him across the table, and they would break all the bones in his feet. 
feet. And they did this on multiple occasions with him. I actually was at his home about a year and a half before he went home to be with the Lord, and he was still walking around his socks because of the pain that was in his feet. When Reverend Wombrandt got up on the stage, he told some of the most incredible stories of persecution I have ever heard. And I actually have a good friend who's a Calvary pastor that worked for Richard Wombrandt for a number of years. And he said, Wes, one time we were going to uh, speak in a church and we got caught in a rainstorm. He goes, probably was in Seattle or someplace around here, that's where he got, you know. But he said, we got caught in a, a rainstorm. He goes, we got in and we were completely soaked. He said, but fortunately we had our luggage. And the pastor said, Reverend Wombrandt, go into my office and change. You're going to be on stage in about five minutes. He goes, when Richard Wombrandt took his shirt off, he said, there were, first thing I noticed, all the places that his body had been burnt, all the places that had been cut, all the places that had been beaten so severely that the skin did not have its natural color. He goes, there were three cuts that ran from his shoulder, across his chest, across his stomach, and all the way down. He goes, but what I recognized the most, he had a round circle, maybe the size of a half a dollar, that was black, and it was down on the right-hand corner of his stomach, and it was also on his back. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time that they tried to get me to deny my faith, and I refused to do it. So they took an iron poker and they heated it in the fire until it turned orange. And then they pushed it all the way through my body, but I would refuse to deny my faith. When Reverend Wombrat got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I don't care if it takes three hours. I need to understand this man's faith. But something that happened that day that shocked me more than anything that Richard Wombrat had said. When the service was dismissed, within about 10 minutes, the entire auditorium was empty. Now, they had four doors on each side and probably four at the back, but there were about 15,000 people there. And I watched thousands of people walk past that man and said, thank you, we'll pray for you. Not one of them did. And not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I thought to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? I know their pastor. They are well taught. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. So I went up to Richard Wombrandt and I said, Reverend Wombrandt, I don't know how to help, but I'd at least like to write a check. Who do I write the check to? And his wife, Sabina, said, write the check to Jesus. So I got out my checkbook and I wrote out a check for $180. Now, folks, that doesn't seem like a lot of money, but at that time in my life, it was probably all that I had. And then Sabina began to talk to me and she said, you know, my husband spent many years in prison but I also spent many years in prison. She goes, it was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no trial. All it took was for an officer to write an order and they would take you out at midnight and shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a young 17 year old girl that they had determined was a threat to the state and the order had been written and she was to be shot that night. She goes, there was a great gloom within the cell because she was a young, beautiful Christian girl and we could not understand what she had done. She said, but all of a sudden, this young girl spoke up and she said, me and my fiance had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries. But that is not how I should glorify him. Tonight, I will glorify him with my death. She said the girl's faith was so dynamic, it was like a light entered into the cell and raised the spirits of all the women. She said when the guards come to take her away, it was a very radical scene because she's a tiny, petite little girl. There's these two big bull of men, they're marching her off to shoot her, and they can hear this young girl talking to these two soldiers, and she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, it would forever change my life. I would never be the same again. And I'm going to come back to this in a moment, and I'm going to explain to you why. When I went to Africa, I did not go there to be a soldier. I went there to be a pastor. The Bible says it's the love of God that compels people under repentance. See, guys, when we go to the mission field or in ministry anywhere in life, we're not there to reflect our ministry, our church, our organization. We're there to reflect Christ and Christ alone. We're there to build up the name of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways that we reach people is by showing the love of Christ to the lost. The Bible says it's the love of Christ that compels people to repentance. The very act of showing God's love is what brings them into the body. My main gift at that time in my life was probably the gift of evangelism. My wife, Wiki, was going to do the women and children's ministry. But what began to happen was rebels began coming into town and attacking villages around us. 
One village they hit, they took 58 children and they crushed their heads against trees. They would come in and rape all the women from the age of nine years old and above. When they were done with them, the most beautiful women, they would take into sexual slavery. Some of these rebel leaders had over 70 women that they had abducted. There were other men's wives, other men's daughters. They were orphaned women that they took into sexual slavery. But the women they didn't want, most often they would just shoot them. But if they didn't shoot them, they would cut their lips off of them, their noses, their ears, their breasts, their fingers. They wanted to bring great terror to the people, and they were extremely effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you have got to protect these women and children. So we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set in northern Uganda and southern Sudan, at first you would see a trickle of women and children coming in. But by the time the sun went down, they estimated 44,000 women and children a night were coming in looking for sanctuary. Under every tree, under every veranda, they were trying to escape the elements and they were trying to escape the enemy. Among the South Sudan army, there are great warriors. They're extremely tenacious in battle, but often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win the battle. When they realized they could not win a battle, they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages that they pulled out of, me and my guys went into right afterwards. The Islamic army came down, they built these huge bonfires, and they picked up all the babies and toddlers and threw them in and burned them alive. And when we got there, we could see the remains of the children in the fire. And the Lord told me, you have got to protect these women and children. So I set the guys down and said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, it is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We are men, they are women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. We are called to protect those that cannot protect themselves. We are called to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemy. He does not hit hard targets. He doesn't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one night, and there's only five of us, just know this is the day you're going to go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man. Because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. See, guys, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, but the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. She was probably about two and a half years of age. She was just a little waif of a thing. Her mother had been killed in a rebel attack. And when we found her, she was still holding onto the body of her dead mother. And I remember walking over and picking her up and putting her in my wife Vicky's lap. And every part of her body is trembling. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves, everything is shaking. See, what this little girl understands that many of us do not is that in southern Sudan and northern Uganda, monsters are real. And they come to kill. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, Honey, you lay your head down tonight and you sleep and you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's going to hurt you tonight. Not on my watch. Tonight the body of Christ is going to wrap its arms around you and we are going to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. Guys, as believers, when you're a soldier, you really do read scripture in a sec different light. I actually just got back and I had two former Navy SEALs over there with me, one from SEAL Team 3 and one from SEAL Team 1. We got about three guys that are really involved and about another four coming aboard. And Jared, who was on SEAL Team 3, was our lead sniper and he had killed 17, or he, or he had 17 snipers under him. He, they said he killed about 300 men. But he was explaining the difference between murder and killing. He said, you know, in one village we went into, the Taliban came in, they hung a 12-year-old boy and they were raping every single woman in the village. And we went in and took them all out. He said, that's protecting women and children. Guys, when men join special forces, there's generally a reason why. And guys, I've got three former special forces Marines, three Navy SEALs, an Army Ranger, and we got a lot of guys, and we're not competitive about being in different organizations. We're just soldiers in the Army of God with one singular purpose, to win a nation and a continent to Jesus Christ. That's it. But when they join it, what a lot of people don't understand why men join special forces is because God has geared them to protect. They're actually made this way to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. And when you do read scripture, you read it in a different light. I think about when King David wanted to build the temple of the Lord, 
And God sends the prophet Nathan to him, and he says, David, it's good that it's in your heart to do this, but you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. Well, guys, probably about four years ago, we had a guerrilla unit probing our village. Our scouts had spotted them, but they were elusive. We estimate well, between 1,000 and 1,200 guerrillas were out there. And we knew that they were coming for the women and children. And I had to deploy the chaplains in the field every night. We'd go out about 7 o'clock at night, and we wouldn't come until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning until we knew that they weren't there. And my standing order was intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one of them get away. Now, guys, if they surrender, will I take them prisoner? Of course I will. But see, if they get away, they're going to come back for the women and children again. And a lot of people have said to me, well, Wes, what about that scripture that says, turn the other cheek? Well, guys, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. It never meant to let them rape your wives, your daughters, to sell them into sexual slavery, to burn children alive. It never meant that. It meant we have a God-given right to protect women and children. We are living in a generation where we are raising generations of effeminate men in America today. Men do not understand their role anymore. I was in Fort Lauderdale about four years ago, and this NFL star got on the airplane. Now, guys, I don't know who he is because I don't have time to follow this, but everybody else on the airplane knows who this guy is. And he gets on the airplane, and he's got a Louis Vuitton over his shoulder. And I looked at the guy, and I go, wait a minute. I go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, and she calls it a purse, you know. <laughs> See, when was it that men got so into fashion? Why was that ever supposed to be important to us? Now, guys, I have nothing wrong with people dressing appropriately, but when men get up and spend an hour grooming themselves every morning and trying to pick out their clothes, something is wrong. As men, we were made for battle. We were made to be in the thick of it. And I think about in my own life, if the Lord were to send, a, if I tried to build the temple of the Lord, I suspect God would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. The great thing is, guys, is I can build his church. And I'd much rather build the church of God than build a building. One of the things as believers, and I want to come back to this young lady now and explain to you why it affected me so much. I have heard generals in the South Sudan Army talk about me. I've walked around corners and I've heard them in conversations. And when you're the only white guy over there, you, you kind of stick out, you know, and, and people will say, what is this white man doing here? And I've heard generals say, you don't understand. This guy's a very serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in battle, and I do. But see, guys, she was a 17-year-old girl. She's just becoming a woman. She's kind of leaving being a young girl to become a young woman. And while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young girls think about marriage. They dream about it their whole life. The wedding ceremony, the day of wearing the dress and the veil, the exchanging of the vows, the intimacy they will share with their husband, the children that would be born to them, and all it would have taken for that young girl to have that was to say, I deny Christ. But she chose to die. I said, Lord, if a young girl could give so much for Jesus Christ, I'm a man of war. How much more should my life count for Jesus Christ? See, one of the things we have to ask ourselves, guys, King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. Has your service to Christ ever cost you anything? Have you ever shared your faith when you weren't sure if it was safe? Have you ever given a financial gift to your home church, and I'm not talking about my ministry, your home church, that actually cost you? Have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do? like childcare. <laughs> I ask people, I say, well, what do you do? I do music. Do you love music? Yes. And it's great that you do. But have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do? You know, guys, I went to Horizon School of Evangelism somewhere around 35 years ago. And one midweek, Mike McIntosh came out on the stage and he goes, one of the ladies didn't show up for childcare. He goes, could we get a volunteer? Well, I had no intention of volunteering. There were hundreds of women in that sanctuary, but not one single one of them raised their hand. They knew something I didn't. <laughs> so using a great lack of discernment, I raised my hand. I got the four-year-olds. <laughs> I would rather be back in Sudan being shot at 
than ever go through that experience again. If I ever do childcare again, I'm taking a gun with me. I think it's only fair. <laughs> but we have to ask ourselves, have we ever done a ministry that has, not, has cost us something? You know, because King David did say, I will not give to the Lord. The rewards of heaven are earned, and this is what I'm trying to explain to you. You need to make your life count for the gospel. Guys, in a little while, we're going to show you a video. And on it, you're going to see a, uh, one of our chaplains that was killed in May of 2014. His name was Peter Guy. You'll recognize him because he's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. I do not know why, but in East Africa, like Southern Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very handsome man or a very good looking woman. I don't know why, it's just a part of the culture over there. Beauty is extremely different in Africa. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good looking over there. If you're <laughs> overweight, they think you're fantastic looking over there. I told my wife, I said, honey, you got to be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio of our village out here, you know, just <laughs> very different. But guys, we got rumored that Peter had been killed in May of 2014. What had happened was the enemy launched a massive offensive. They came down with 7,000 soldiers. Peter's unit was the first one scrambled and sent to attack while other units were being assembled, but they only had 700 men. We hit the enemy headlong. We fought three major battles. 300 men were killed. There were 400 men left. There was an ominous feeling among all the men that everybody was going to die. And you know what? They're right. All 400 were going to die. We actually lost three men that day. And the only reason we know what happened is we had a fourth chaplain whose name was also Peter. And about two days before in the final battle, he was sent out as a runner. And he told us about the last three weeks of Peter's life. And he said, Wes, Peter was really suffering in the final days of his life. He said a month before he died, his wife left him for another man. And she said to him, I do not want to be married to a pastor. I do not want to be in the ministry. I want a better life. There is no better life there. It was just lust for another man. But it broke his heart and it broke his spirit. But it did not break his will to serve Christ. And he said, I would watch Peter. He said, he would not tell the soldiers what he was going through. He was bewildered. He would talk to us and say, I don't know what I did. I don't know why. I, I, I loved her. I don't know what happened. He goes, but then he would take his Bible and he'd go out and sit down with 20 men and he'd open up the Word of God and 30 minutes later all their heads would go down and he'd lead them to Christ. And then there'd be 10 and then 5 and another 10 and 15 and 20. And when he was absolutely exhausted, he would come back and suffer in silence with us. And then he'd go back out and do it all over again. He said a week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to leave the military, come home and take care of your children. And Peter responded, he said, first of all, I'm a soldier in the South Sudan army. If I were to leave, it's desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. He said, but far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in radio communication just before the last battle. And the last transmission we got was they said, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after this battle. Call never came. All 400 men were killed. We have never recovered Peter's body or our other two men. They lie among some 700 men whose bodies are no longer distinguishable by the ravages of war. But guys, I have often thought about when Peter crossed over. See, Peter didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Jesus Christ. Whatever the heartache, whatever the sorrow, whatever the betrayal he felt, he is a prince in the kingdom of God, and his rewards will be great. I think of the story of the ten minas, and it says that God gives a mina to three different men. One bears ten, one bears five, one bears it in the ground. To the one that bears 10, he says you're going to be in charge of 10 cities. To the one that bears 5, you're going to be in charge of 5 cities. To the one that bears it in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has 10. They said, but sir, he already has 10. He goes, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one that has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And guys, what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for the kingdom of God. Now, it's strange to think, and I've actually studied this scripture quite extensively, that if we win 10 souls in this life, that we might be in charge of 10 cities in the kingdom of God. 
I actually was talking to David Guzak. I was teaching a conference with him in Mexico a few years ago, and David's quite the theologian. I said, David, do you actually believe that we will rule over cities in the kingdom of God? He goes, Wes, there's many theologians that believe, much like the British Empire, they would have a viceroy over India, the Sudan, Uganda, Kenya. We're going to be viceroys in the kingdom of God. Is Peter over 400 cities? I don't know. But what I do know is the Bible says the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Guys, we don't have the ability to understand what the treasures of heaven are like. One of the things I do know is the Bible says that when we get to heaven, God is going to wash away every soul and every tear. And I've always heard people say, well, that's for the loved one that didn't get saved. I don't think it's what it is at all. I think it's when we see the lives that we could have had and we chose not to have them. That's where God's going to have to wash away the sorrows, realizing that our life could have counted so much more for Christ. In a moment, we're going to show you this video. The first part of it is about the Syrian church. And guys, we are operating in 28 countries around the world today. Uh, we have a division of our ministry called Ghost Operations. It's the invisible hand into the closed world of radical Islam. We have 400 pastors that are probably fully sponsored right now. Our goal is to have 700, but we're in Afghanistan and Pakistan under the Taliban. We're in Syria and Iraq under ISIS and Al-Qaeda. There are areas of Hamas, Hezbollah, and all these radical Islamic areas. It's difficult to watch because of what the Syrian church is going through, but it's also extremely inspiring. The second part will show you of all the chapters that were killed in Christ's service. And remember Peter Guy because of the gap. Let's go ahead and show that, guys. When the war start, many problems happen, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some, someday uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together, and I said, as in Acts book, the believers, when they have the persecuted, most of them they go out of Jerusalem. If you want now to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lost our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after time, I turned back to see the decision of the leaders. I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave. We will continue to serve God here in this area. And we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are non-Christian background and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we built a graveyard. This graveyard for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it first uh, happened in Raqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity now, you can be, uh, hold your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it's must to, to, to take it directly. And most of the uh, Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the uh, area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your, what will happen to you. 
uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, with his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they asked the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son in front of your, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between these uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, so sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue in the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important thing for, uh, for our life to be in God willing, this is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life and when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this. When I go, don't cry for me In my father's arms I'll be The wounds this world left on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole Sun and moon will be replaced With the light of Jesus' face And I will not be ashamed For my Savior knows my name It don't matter Where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't on my soul I'll be healed and I'll be whole sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus face and I will not be ashamed for my Savior knows my name it don't matter where you bury me I'll be home and I'll be free It don't matter where I lay All my tears All my tears 
sun and moon will be replaced with the light of Jesus' face. I'll be home and I'll be free. We have this thought as believers that there has to be a bottom. There's a place that Satan just, he gets to the bottom and, it, it, and that's just it, it can't go any lower. After 25 going on 26 years of being in the Southern Sudan, I've learned there's no truth in it whatsoever. Guys, we begin to have rebels come in our area and capture families and African families can be quite large. Four to seven kids can be normal. 11, 12, 13 is not unusual. What they started doing most oftenly is they'd find a little girl of about nine or 10 years of age and they would give her a machete and they would tell her to cut the head off her mother. If the child refused to do it, they'd say, if you do not cut the head off your mother, we're gonna cut the head off your father, your mother, your brothers and your sisters, and then we're gonna kill you. And mothers would beg their children to kill them. I have counseled many of these children there is no English ability to explain it to you. We just don't have words for it. I know that a lot of what I share with you seems very shocking, but guys, I don't even tell you the bad stories. It goes far beyond anything I'm sharing with you. There's just some things that are so graphic and so perverse that I don't feel it's appropriate to share with the body of Christ. We're trying to educate you. We're not trying to shock you. I've shared with people that I have never had a problem with having to take human life. Now don't misunderstand me, folks. I do not enjoy killing. I never have and I never will. But when men come to rape women, to cut their breast off of them, to sell them into sexual slavery, to burn children alive, we're gonna do exactly what it takes to stop them. It's just all there is to it. We have a God-given right as men to protect women and children. I believe that we have a misunderstanding of what it means to count the cost, guys. And I do a tremendous amount of reading of history, guys. I actually have five libraries, two at my home and three at my office. And right now I'm reading a book on the legions of Rome, one on Genghis Khan, one on Stalingrad, and one on the, I read one on the Knight Templars. And guys, one of the things about the Knight Templars, and people have asked me, are you supporting the Catholic Church? Well, the Knight Templars lived a thousand years ago, and a thousand years ago the Catholic Church was the church. Now, I don't agree with their doctrine. But back then, the men did not have the Word of God. They were not allowed to read the Bible. They were told by the Pope and the priest what to believe. And to the best of their ability, they were trying to follow what they thought to be God's law. You know, the church in many ways has always been the church. In almost every denomination, you will find true believers and false believers. I have, when I first got to Sudan, guys, 26 years ago, I ran into a, a Catholic priest. He was Italian. He'd been out there for 30 years. Now, I don't agree with this doctrine at all. I want to be, be very clear about that. But there was no doubt that he loved Christ. And there was no doubt with the knowledge that he had, he was trying to lead people to Christ. I have met Calvary Chapel pastors that have committed adultery, that have embezzled from the church. I know some that have been arrested as pedophiles. I know one that got a woman pregnant and murdered her to hide it. He's in prison today. I actually spoke in his church when he was still walking with Christ. He deserves to be in prison. The Bible says a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree bears good fruit. And guys, one of the things about being a man of God, our call to the ministry, we are to live lives that are above reproach. But when you chose the life of a Knight Templar, you were considered God's holy warrior. You had no material possession. You were not allowed to ever marry. And their job was to protect the church and to protect Christians on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. A thousand years ago, the Muslims were raiding Christian caravans, killing the men or selling them into slavery, raping their wives. In Islam, it actually teaches that you can make a woman a prostitute. If you capture an infidel woman, you can make her a prostitute. What a wonderful, peace-loving religion that is. When Saladin was trying to retake over all of Israel, he was marching with his army. And 140 knights found out that he was coming, and they set out to intercept him. But Saladin was not by himself. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. 
And one day's march behind was over 100,000 men. Some of the knights wanted to turn and run, but there was a knight by the name of Gerard, and Gerard said, listen, men, we've been sworn to serve. We have been sworn to protect. And whether we live or we die, we will be with Christ. And 140 knights attacked 7,000 Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last one to fall was a man by the name of James of Malise. And when all the other knights had been killed, he charged a thousand Saracens. The Saracens were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not enslave you. We will not torture you. We will harm you in no way. We will let you go. Just stop. But he was sworn to protect. So he fought till they killed him. The Islamic army actually thought that they had killed a Christian saint. They had never seen this before. And the interesting thing about this story, guys, is this is not a part of Christian history. All the Christians were dead. This is a part of Islamic history. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. Again, we're not here to reflect ourselves. We're here to reflect Jesus Christ. I actually had a a Hollywood producer, and he was a big-time producer. He had seven or eight studios up in Los Angeles, and he spent 10 hours and he tried to get me to do a movie based on my life. And he wanted to make me out to be a Christian Rambo, and I told him no. I said, first of all, your story's not true. The second is I'm not the hero, it's Jesus Christ. And he goes, Wes, I am giving you what everybody dreams of. I said, everybody who's carnal. The Bible says that no flesh shall glory in the presence of God. We're not here to reflect ourselves. We're here to reflect Christ. I probably had a dozen people try to get me to write a book, folks, and just as early as about six months ago, somebody really spent days trying to persuade me, and I I told them no. And guys, I'm not saying that I won't ever write a book. If the Lord tells me to do it, I will do it. But I have not felt like the Lord wants me to do it. I feel like we have the only book that we really need right here. This is the answer for the world. I do see the value in certain books. But again, one of the things I want to encourage you as believers is as we race towards eternity, we are to be so different from the world that they look at us and they say, what is it about these people? Who are these people? Let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. As believers... You have been given this one precious life to serve Christ. If you throw it away, you will not get a second chance. I do not know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of my life is. I have, whether it's the still, small, quiet voice of the Lord or premonition, I don't know but I suspect that I will not live out my natural life. I have a suspicion that at some point I'm going to be killed in the South Sudan. And when that day comes and I stand before a holy God and I look into him for the, for his eyes for the first time, I want to hear him say, well done, son, well done. And I want to encourage you too. Folks, you need to begin selling, sharing your faith. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. I've known Kevin for 20 years. He has a pastor's heart. I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized you had to like people, and I said, "Mm, mm, I, I can't do that. To whom much has been given, much shall be required. You have been well taught. You need to start inviting people to church every Sunday, not once in a lifetime or once in a year. But we are to look for every opportunity to share our faith. And guys, sometimes God leads you to go out and share your faith, and and you go from the beginning to a salvation message in one session. But I find that what works most often is to say to someone, and this is what I do, and my life is different, but I'll say, 40 years ago I was an extremely violent man. And someone invited me to Calvary Chapel, and it changed everything. Why don't you come see what you think? You don't even have to beat him up with the gospel. You bring him here, you let Kevin beat him up with the gospel, okay? He'll take care of it for you. In closing this morning, folks, the last thing in closing here is is believers of Jesus Christ, 
I, I don't think we really understand what the treasures of heaven are like. There, there is going to be such a joy for those that have served. And, 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 and the thought of when we step to the other side and we look into Christ I, and you realize that your life has been well spent for the gospel. God wants you to experience that. He wants you to know what it's like to have had a life that had real meaning for him. As King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. You know, this last refreshers course, we had eight generals of the South Sudan Army show up. The commanding general, four-star general, two three-star generals, a couple two-star generals, and then some brigadier generals. And one night we're out there and we're worshiping the Lord. We have this big bonfire. And the guys are out there, they're strapped in their weapons. And I'm looking around and I'm seeing 350 men with their hands in the air and they're worshiping Christ. And I look over and I start to see these generals, all of a sudden all these generals' hands start going up and they're worshiping Christ. And I thought, Lord, how was I ever so blessed to experience this? Obedience is a safety net for the believer. And guys, the greatest life that you will ever live is the life that is given to Christ. Dustin, would you come up and close? God bless you. Gloria is your name in all the earth. your name in all the